All right, I'm going to try to show you this uh, 5.3 fundamental theorem of calculus. It's it's really not even that important. I don't know why we're doing it. Uh, just kidding. It's kind of important. So we'll say FTC if we abbreviate the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right. So let's see how we do here. So first of all, I've got a graph. And I'm going to say I've got this function. I'm going to call it f of t, right? And I'm going to find the area from a, let's say I've got b over here, and this x-axis, this is t. That's why this function is f of t, OK? Uh, I'm going to say I would like to find the area from a all the way to, let's say, x. And let's say that, that this could change. So let's say I want to find all this area, but maybe I'll slide x over a little bit more and I'll find more area. But I'm going to define the area that I, find, that I get here. I'm going to define it as uh, g of x. So the area is g of x. And this is kind of like, we could say it's the area so far kind of function. So if I kept sliding the x over, then I'd get more area under the curve. If I come a little closer, I'll have less area, etc. And we'll do an example with this in just a little bit. So I'm calling this the area so far function. Uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, well, so let's say, let's try to come up with, a, with a, how much area this would be. So this would be... Uh, g of x, my function is g of x, and how would I define that area from a to x? I'm hoping that you would say it would be the integral from a to x, and then it would be of whatever the function is, so this function is f of t, and normally it's dx, but it's dt, because the variable is t, and that's it, and this would be from, let's say from a to b is all I care about. So x is between uh, a and b, actually. Uh, yeah, x is between a and b in this case. Okay? Uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, so this is the FTC, it's part one, okay? Part one. It says uh, that if you have this particular function, like this, and you were to take the derivative of it, then the derivative would actually undo the integral because they're opposite operations. So it would actually get rid of the integral and then you'd be left with this function. Uh, the only difference is that this top limit of integration actually goes in for this variable. So g prime of x actually equals f of x. But the, the really big deal is just that when you take the derivative of an integral, it undoes, the, it undoes the integral, again, because they're inverse operations. This is a really important theorem because it connects differential calculus with integral calculus, is what, which is what we've been starting with Chapter 5, the whole working backwards aspect, okay? So hopefully by the end of this chapter, you know, the calculus you know, starts making a little bit more sense. Uh, let me do an example of this. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Let's do an example. And yeah, I'll leave that. I guess. No. Okay. All right. Example one. Similar situation, I'm just going to go ahead and do a sketch of it. So this is the graph, this is the graph of f of t that we would have to be given. So negative 3, 0, I've got a point at negative 2, 2. 
2. I've got a point at negative 1, 3. And it kind of goes like this. And then I've got a point at 1, negative 3. Again, this is just a graph that's given to us. 2, negative 2. And 3, 0. Okay, so there's the graph. Let's try to answer some questions about it. So part A, let's say it says evaluate, and it says evaluate g of negative 3, and g of 3. All right, so g of negative 3, g of negative 3, means that if this function is the area so far function from negative 3 to some x, then that means this would be from negative 3 all the way to negative 3. It wouldn't go anywhere. So how much area would we have gathered up under the curve? How much area is there from negative 3 and negative 3? Okay. No area. We haven't accumulated any area yet. So how about if we plug it into 3? That means we would have negative 3, and we'd go all the way to the x, which we're saying the x in this case is 3, of this particular function. We look at the function, remember when it's above the x-axis, that's positive error, you know, that's a positive amount. When it's below the x-axis, it's a negative amount, and if I drew my picture correctly, then it looks like there's the same amount of area in both, and so we will actually be back to zero. So I'll have a net area of zero. So that's kind of part A there. Um, part B. Estimate, so this real estimate because we couldn't, we couldn't do this exactly. So estimate g of negative two and then also g of zero. So g of negative two would be however much area has it been accumulating there from negative three to negative 2, and let's say we look at that and we say, well, it's about this much area. And it's not like it's a perfect triangle or anything, but let's say it's the closest shape we can think of to make sense of the area, uh, since we're not really talking about evaluating quite yet. So let's say I make it a little triangle, so I would go 1 half. Um, base would be just one unit right here, and then it would go up two units, so one times two. So very approximate amount of area would be, uh, I'll do an approximate, so about one, okay, has been gathered up as far as area goes. Okay, then g of one, so now we would go negative three to zero. And that would be all of this now. So all of this area, how much have we accumulated? So we'd have to uh, probably come up with some other shapes for that. Um, uh, I'm going to come up with an approximation of 5. Okay. So I'm just going to say about 5 units. So I could do, you know, maybe a couple triangles, something. But I'm going to, just for now, I'm going to say that that's about, it's about 5. All right, part C. On what interval? On what interval is g of x increasing? So, on what interval is another way of saying it? On what interval is the area continuing to rise? You know, before it ever decreases. So it looks like from negative 3 all the way to 0, we're going to be accumulating more area. Then we get to 0, and we're actually going to start lowering, you know, because we're going to start taking away. Because remember, the integral is a net area under the curve. So we would say the interval where it's increasing is negative 3 to 0. All right. Uh, similar kind of a follow-up question, part D. Uh, where does g have a maximum value? Where does G have a max value? Where would the area then be the most? 
Well, if you're accumulating this whole time, and then all of a sudden you start taking away, this right here would be the spot where it would be at its highest. So we would say uh, g of 0, at g of 0. Okay. And then part E, draw a rough sketch of G, so kind of maybe out of room here. So I might need to erase a little bit. So this is part E, draw a rough sketch of G. area have we accumulated at negative 3? Well, at negative 3, remember, we're just plugging in the next value, and then our y value is actually equaling the area. So that means we haven't had any area, so that's still going to be at 0. We did figure out, I think we had an estimate for g of negative 2, and we said that it was 1. So that means that that's the area, that's the y coordinate. When you plug in a negative 2, you get a 1. Uh, negative 1, don't know what that was, we didn't find that specifically, we could have come up with an estimate. We did um, add a thin air a little bit, but I said 0, 5. So I go up to 5, I got that dot, and then this thing what is symmetric, you know, we can tell the amount that we're increasing the area, we're also losing it here. And so at 3, we were back down to no area. So this actually goes up, very roughly, goes up, and then it actually comes down, okay, something like that. Something really roughly like that, okay. And that represents the g of x. Then, uh, last thing, part f, use g to graph g prime. So use g of x to graph g prime of x. Well, if we wanted to use this, then we could kind of sketch it, sort of. Remember how we sketch derivatives? We say, okay, the key spots to look at are like where it equals zero. So that means right here it would equal zero. And then, you know, like right here, it's uh, increasing. And then here it starts to level out. So, uh, let's see, uh, so this whole part right here, from zero, from negative 3 to 0, it's definitely all positive, and then all of a sudden it gets right here in the slope, so the tangent lines become negative. Well, the way this is supposed to work is that all these slopes, they would, uh, they actually, if you do this, you know, if we were to do this correctly, that this would all be positive because it starts it starts leveling out like about right here it starts getting less steep and then it gets to zero and then it becomes actually a negative slope and it's kind of maybe uh, gets more steep so just a horrible picture sorry and so this and then and then it gets back here at three, it actually levels out. So the problem is, I think I've just got a horrible picture. That's what I think my problem is. I think it goes more like this. Okay. That's what I think it is. Very rough. Ugh. Ugh. Sorry. So anyway, the idea is that if you have the g function and you took the derivative, then you would get this function back again. That's the, that's the main point. Okay, that's the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 1. Okay. That's the, that's the harder of the two, maybe. Alright. Alright. Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 2. FTC, Part 2. Okay. It says this. It says... 
you know, f is continuous on the interval a, b, then we have the integral a, and this helps us evaluate it. So the integral from a to b of the function f of x dx is equal to, and what you do to evaluate this is you find the antiderivative. So the antiderivative is capital F of X, and we evaluate it from A to B. And the way we evaluate it is you just take the top number and you plug it in, and then you subtract the bottom number, and you plug it in. So that is fundamental theorem of calculus, part two. So let's take a look at some examples of that. So example two. Okay, so this is one we kind of looked at before. We do the antiderivative of this one. We just, or we evaluate this integral. We find the antiderivative, which is adding one to it, dividing by three, that same number. We're gonna find it from zero to one. You plug in the 1, so that's 1 cubed over 3 minus 0 over 3, or 0. So we get an answer of 1 third. So that's the area under the curve from 0 to 1 of the function x squared. Okay, erase that guy. Okay, example 3. I do all of them, it would, I would just have six, but they're all quick now, okay? All right, so we've got this function, and we want to find the area under the curve from three to six. So the way we would do it is we have to think about what function this is. So this is the function one over x dx, okay? So the function is one over x. Can you figure out uh, an antiderivative for that? Can you think of a function that when you take the derivative of it, it gives you 1 over x? Tell me you can. Tell me you're thinking natural log. Good. You are? All right. So natural log of x evaluated from 3 to 6. And then all we would do is, actually it's natural log, I should say, absolute value. Because we want to make sure that this argument stays positive all the time for natural logs. Okay, so we make sure that's positive. And so now we're ready to plug in the top number first, and then minus the bottom number. So we would say, we'd use our little uh, logarithm tricks. So we'd say natural log, and remember how you can, if there's a minus sign, you can divide them. So it's six divided by three, which is natural log of two. So that's your final answer, or uh, decimal approximation 0.69. So what did we just figure out? <clears throat> we just figured out that the graph of the function, you know, 1 over x, which looks like this, roughly, that if we were to find the area under the curve from 3 to 6, that the amount of area under the curve is 0.69. Okay. So probably my three would know, be slid over a little bit, but that's that's what we're finding, the area under the curve. All right. All right, uh, example four. Integral zero to pi sine x. Okay. So now we have to think of the antiderivative of sine x, which is, um, you know, we're tempted to say cosine, but if you took the derivative of cosine, that would have been minus sine x. So we have to make the adjustment. So we have to say minus cosine x, evaluate it from zero to pi. And then we're gonna plug our numbers in, plug our top number in. So we got minus cosine pi, minus, minus always there, and then we have a minus cosine, oops, running out of room, zero. So let's figure out what's cosine of pi. So remember what that is, you know, you're over here at pi and cosine is the x coordinate there, so it's negative one. So this part is negative one, but there's a negative in front of it, so let's make that one. 
negative, negative, so that's plus. Cosine is zero, it's right here. So that's one. So that's one plus one, so two. All right, so we got an area of two. Let's see what, what we found here. So we're saying that if we have the graph of sine, and it goes roughly like this, and we want to find the area under the curve from zero to pi, all of this, that's an area of two. Okay. Oh, that's my dog scratching the mouth. Okay. Uh, example five. Last two little ones here. All right. So let's say we want the integral, Sunny, stop scratching. Integral from one to three, u the x dx. All right. So we know the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x, so there's no change. So same thing. And we evaluate it from one to three. And then we just plug in the top number. So e cubed minus e. So that's your answer. So, and that's okay, we can leave it like that. Or if you want a decimal approximation, you can as well. So again, graphically, uh, e to the x looks like this. And we just found out that the area from one to three is all of that, and that amount is e cubed minus e, exactly. All right, last one. All right, hopefully you're getting this. Six, last one, integral from one to two, and it's six x minus two dx. All right, so the way this works is same thing, just find the antiderivative. So it's gonna be six, and that's x squared divided by two minus two x. And then we're evaluating it from one to two. So um, you could simplify this a little bit first if you want to. Maybe we'll do that. So let's say this would be 3x squared minus 2x evaluated from 1 to 2. And what you'll do is you'll take a 2 and you'll plug it into all the x's first. So plug a 2 in. So I'm going to show all my work. So 3 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2. So that's plugging the 2 in. Then there's a big minus. And then you take the one and you plug it in for all of them. So, but it's it's minus the whole expression. So just be careful with parentheses and everything. So you plug in a one. So it's three times one squared minus two times one. Uh, all right. So we should get. If you do all that, I know I'm getting close to the bottom of the screen. So that would be. So actually, let me put it up here a little bit. So this would be, what, 12 minus 4, so we should have 8. So we got 8, and then minus, and then that math there, that looks like just 1, right? So we got 1, so we got 7. So the area under the curve is 7 for this particular graph. And you know, this is just a line, this is just a line. So right here at negative 2, you go up 6. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 over 1. Let's graph like that. And we're finding the area from 1 to 2. So that would be like from 1 to 2, like something like this. That much. Okay. Roughly. Okay. So that should do it for us. We'll do a few more gap fillers later.